talking about the vaccines up until early April. The data I went through indicate that there are 42 vaccines. Most of them are still preclinical, that is in phase one uh, of the research. Apart from two, which are very close to phase two, one coming from Australia and France, and it is using the BCG vaccines, which we use it for tuberculosis as a life attenuated virus. The second one is from China with the lentiviral, and both are very close to phase two. There are four phases to develop the vaccine. The other three vaccines which are in the focus of research from UK, United States and China, all of them were still in phase The one from state uh, based on RNA in the vaccination, the one from UK and China, the two in the phase one, they are from or using a non-replicating viral vector. But we should realize that this is a lengthy process and it usually extends up to 12 months or even more. Now, talking about treatment, uh, we all know that there is no available treatment for this virus as we know it is a new virus, it's a new strain of uh, virus. But currently and up until the 4th of April, there are 29 trials, most of them coming from state and China, 11 from United States and 9 from China. There are three which are multi-center, two coming from Germany and one from each uh, Australia, France and Canada. Out of these 40, uh, sorry, 29 trials, uh, there are only two reaching phase four, and there are six in phase three, and five in phase two, moving to phase three. Now, what does this mean? I'll try to explain what does this mean by going through the phases of clinical research. There are five phases of clinical research. The phase zero, which involves usually a small sample of volunteer, healthy volunteer, between 10 and 15. And this is mainly for what's called as micro-dosing, and it focuses on the pharmacokinetics of that age. That is phase zero. Phase one is uh, focusing on the safety and range of side effects of the agent tested. And this will need uh, a sample of 10 to 100 healthy volunteer. Phase three focus on the biological activities and needs a bigger sample which extend between 100 and 300 uh, participants. Phase 3 is to test the effectiveness, that is the value of the agent in a clinical life, in a clinical practice, and this need much bigger sample of tested people uh, extend up to 3,000, between 300 and 3,000. Now, phase four is the final force, uh, final phase, and it is post marketing assessment. So, we can imagine we have at least two agents right now are very close to be ready to use, and there are at least six agents or six type of treatment which are close to this phase. There are 
a variety of agents and a spectrum of those agents. And with the disparity, uh, we can notice that a lot of agents uh, which are not in use were tried to, to help in the treatment of this disease. I'll start with the antiviral uh, treatment, antiviral agents. There is no specific COVID-19 agent among those antiviral uh, treatments. But the one widely focused on and in the focus of all the research is the remidesivir. Now, this agent is, as an antiviral agent, was shown to have an ability to control SARS and MERS, the previous uh, epidemics and the viruses controlling them. It, it, it works on, first of all, reducing the viral load during the process of infection, and it also works on improving the lung damage caused by the virus. This agent was tested during the Ebola epidemic in Africa. And that's why the safety data from that testing are available, which will shorten the road toward phase four uh, in, the, in, in the study regarding COVID-19. Uh, it was used experimentally also with MERS. And it was found that giving the agent, this antiviral agent, 24 hours before the inoculation, that's experimental, I'm talking about experimental, uh, help in limiting the disease period and expedite recovery. Now, this virus works at the level of ACE2, the angiotensine converting enzyme 2, where the receptor is the target of the virus in attacking the cell there and it introduces itself, itself into the virus and start the process of uh, replication and damage. And there is a similarity between the COVID-19 and its virus, the COV-2 and the COV-1, which caused the SARS epidemic. Remedisivir is a nucleotide analog, which is as a category used widely in other viruses, particularly the hepatitis type there and the HIV. But it is a novel agent for coronavirus. Um, the first time it's used was on the first case discovered in Washington in late January uh, this year, first case of COVID-19. But there are two good studies, with good number in total of about 700 coming from China with a promising result. And they, they, they are expecting for this result to be published late April, current April or May. There are some similar studies in the United States, but it is not clear up to where in terms of these phases of research they are. The second antiviral agent is the Fafi, Fafi Prever, which is an agent used widely by Japan for treating influenza epidemic there. And there, there is about 240 patients studied in China for the use of this agent but all of them were in the middle range of severity. Say, so all of them, they have straightforward pneumonia and they are not having the extreme of the spectrum of manifestation. Uh, this study is, is as weak as it is an open label uh, 
study, so it's not controlled or randomized. So it is a weak study, but the data showed some beneficial effect of using this agent in the setting of moderately severe disease. The third antiviral agent uh, is uh, uh, it's called Calitra, and it is a protease inhibitor used in the or studied on HIV patient there, and it's a combination of two different. Uh, um, now, this agent is studied uh, to my checking there in Australia and in New Zealand, uh, comparing its efficacy with the chloroquine. And I'm not aware of uh, other. Uh, uh, centers in using this agent, except uh, uh, the study that was started in China was stopped probably for inefficacy during the study. Now, the second agent uh, with some promising data is the very old chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine that now everyone start to be aware of its use in COVID-19 treatment uh, through the media. Uh, it is well-known agent in the treatment of malaria, rheumatoid arthritis, and systemic lupus erythematosus. And it's well established that it is a safe agent if it's used over a short course. How does this agent work? It's not clear yet. Uh, there is some speculation that it has, uh, in addition to its anti-inflammatory effect and the immune protective effect, it can have some effect on the angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor, blocking them and affecting the introduction of the virus itself to the into the cell. So the mechanism at the end, it's preventing the virus from entering the cell and for those viruses which manage to uh, enter the cell, it makes it very hard for them, very hard for them to replicate and increase in number. There are several studies on this very familiar and very common and cheap medical agent, but only preliminary result appeared from two of them. One is a, a report actually published in February this year uh, with data from around 100 patients. And the result indicates that it is superior to placebo when it is used early in the face of the disease and it helps both on the clinical side by improving the pneumonia and the resolution of the radiological changes and also on the line of expedizing the clearance of the virus from the body and shorten the duration of the illness. But again, this is a report it is not strong or powerful uh, study or data as it is without, uh, without any randomization. No. The second report is virtually a small study coming from France, from South France, and it is not randomized, but it compared 26 patients receiving chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine versus 16 who haven't received it for a course of six days. And it appears that the virus has been cleared in 70% of the 26 cases received the chloroquine versus clearance of 12.5%. Now, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are in phase 2 slash 3 in both United States and China. In China, they found that adding azithromycin, which is uh, uh, an antibiotic very well known, uh, 
uh, to the chloroquine news which help in faster clearance of the virus. But uh, I don't have uh, much details about uh, this, this information or this data and I gather that it is again not a well-controlled randomized study. Now, chloroquine is in the recommendation of both the China National Health Commission and the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in in the United States. And I think lately we, we heard about an exceptional approval of the chloroquine by the FDA. So it is news. Uh, obviously, when in, in in the face of disparity, trying agents, available agents, non in use for other purposes for a long period of time, with a very well known uh, margin of side effect is, is justified. But again, this should be used with caution and under a strict supervision, checking the health of the patient, other comorbidities, the renal function, all other variant before talking about introducing any of those agents. The third modality in the list of treating COVID-19 is the convalescent plasma. It is the plasma of patient recovered from the disease. The concept of using convalescent uh, plasma is very old one. It dates back to more than 130 years and it, it was in use in cases of measles, chickenpox, polio, and more recently in SARS epidemic and also in the Ebola. The, the donor for this plasma and the concept of it based on having enough antibodies in a plasma donated by a patient, by an ex-patient to, to the current patient to boost its immune uh, system and help in the fighting against the coronavirus. There is a strict selection of the, of the donor uh, that first it is an ex-patient by test. So the testing of the patient indicates that he recovered completely from the, from the coronavirus or COVID-19. Two, he should be asymptomatic. Three, he should be screened for a variety of other viruses, like any donation, like any uh, donation of body fluids, their blood, plasma, etc. So he should be screened against HIV, hepatitis of all types and other viruses before it's qualified to donate his plasma for this treatment. And it was estimated that the plasma of one ex-patient, the convalescent plasma, uh, can help three current patients of COVID-19. Now, the state is strong on the use of this convalescent plasma, and there is a group of hospitals, in addition to Mayo Clinic and the America uh, Red Cross, in a consortium to, uh, to help in putting this modality of treatment into uh, action or reality. In China, there is only a small study, and they conclude that it, it might be helpful. The fourth modality is one of those available agents in use for other purposes. It's the, uh, it's the ivermectin. The ivermectin is an agent used widely, at least since uh, 1980 here in Australia in both topical form and oral form. In the topical form, as either ointment or cream, it's used in the treatment of head lice. 
In the tablet form, it is well recognized as second line treatment in, uh, of, of scabies. It is used also for the round worm, which is one of the intestinal uh, worm or uh, parasites. And it is used in a rosacea, which is a, a skin disorder with a, a, a reddish discoloration of the of the thing. So it is in used for all these purposes for long periods of time. But more recently and even before the era of corona, uh, it was found that it has also some antiviral activities. Uh, it is already approved in the United States by the FDA for the treatment of HIV, influenza, and dengue. So it's approved for all these, which means the margin of safety is already studied widely there on, on, on human being there. And in Australia, actually, the, the, the most widely studied agent uh, is the uh, Avermatin, and there is a good work by uh, Monash University and Royal Mor Melbourne Hospital uh, uh, on Avermatin. The, the initial data indicate a very impressive result that in two days of using this agent, uh, there is a clearance of the virus, and even after the first 24 hours of tears. Uh, uh, there is significant drop in the viral load on testing. So this is a, a, a great uh, success, but um, we are not quite clear on when the introduction to the general use will start. But the reassuring thing is that this is a very well-known agent uh, with uh, minimal side effects. The five modality is the interleukin-6 inhibitor. Now, during the process of infection with a virus causing COVID-19, there is a surge. There is what's called uh, as cytokine storm, where a variety of inflammatory agents or uh, substances released to the circulation, particularly among the interleukins, the interleukin-1, interleukin-6, interleukin-12, and interleukin-18, in addition to the tumor necrosis factor, the TNF, and other inflammatory agents. That's why targeting these cytokines can be beneficial of help in the treatment of this infection. Now, the interleukin-6 is a cytokine known to us and it is relevant to a variety of inflammatory and immune-related uh, disorders there. There is uh, an anecdotal data about the first interleukin-6 with, which is the ectimera, that it can be of help in coronavirus. And currently, there are two studies, one from America by Roche, the very well-known company, using the ectimera, the tocilizumab, in the treatment of COVID-19. And currently, this study is in phase three. There is also a smaller study, a weak one, it is an open label, not controlled, coming from China on 21 patients with what they describe it as an excellent result. So watch the space for this agent. The sixth modality is the protease inhibitor. The protease inhibitor our agents widely used against the HIV and the hepatitis, particularly hepatitis C. And there are a wide range of uh, agents of this family. They work by inhibiting the proteolytic cleavage of the protein particles which are used in the replication of the virus. 
and currently the main trials are from China. There are two trials. One is in phase four, very close to clinical use, and the other one is in phase three. The seven agent is the leukine. The leukine is, uh, is a GM CSF agent, which is in fact uh, a growth factor for the white cell. It stimulates the stem cells in the bone marrow to produce more of the granulocytes, like the neutrophil, the eosinophil, and the basophil, and more of the immunocyte to boost the immune process in fighting against infection and against uh, uh, the corona virus. And there is a study in Germany, there is one study on this agent in Germany reaching phase four, so it is not far from the clinical board. The eighth agent is the JAK inhibitor. The JAK molecule is, is, is a molecule with a key role in a variety of inflammatory and autoimmune diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic uh, arthropathies, uh, the Inflammatory bowel disease, it is one of the target for the treatment of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, in addition to its role in a variety of skin disorder. So it's well uh, recognized. There are at least 20 JAK inhibitors. Some of them are used for both the rheumatoid arthritis and the psoriatic arthropathy. And currently, there is a multi-center study reaching phase four uh, using this agent. The ninth agent is actually using the enzyme in the ACE2, the angiotensin converting enzyme. Two, it is the human recombinant uh, ACE2. Now, this receptor we know on the surface of the cell, the ACE2 receptor on the surface of the cell, targeted by the by the virus, by the coronavirus, it is usually attacked by the. S1 protein, which is the which is the spike on the on the virus. So the reaction between the S1 protein spike of the virus together with the ACE2 receptors is the key for the virus to enter the cell and start the process of replication and damage. There is a good work from Canada and Austria on this molecule, on this enzyme, and it found that there is uh, some data that the ACE2 is helpful in protecting the uh, lung, in particular, against damage caused by the virus. Another agent is the vitamin C. Now, a lot of people, they focus on vitamin C in the prevention. But using a high doses of vitamin C intravenously was also proposed to be a line of treating the COVID-19. This is not a new concept. It is known from previous data on other uh, sepsis, on sepsis related to other infection, that high dose vitamin C can help in reducing the mortality. And that appeared in a study in 2017. In 2019, there, late 19, there is some data that such a high dose of vitamin C given intravenously can be of help in the acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a, a form of uh, a severe spectrum of the COVID-19. 
Um, in, in China, there is also uh, a study uh, about using it, and it sounds that they, they are expecting the result of this study in a couple of months. So this is the only study that I came across in using high dose of vitamin C intravenously in the management of COVID-19 coming from China, and we're still waiting for the result. The prevention. Now, there is no evidence that high dose vitamin C help in the prevention of, uh, of the coronavirus, whether COV1 or COV2. And we have good evidence that high doses can be sometimes harmful by causing uh, problems like nausea, cramps, or even changing the balances and precipitating uh, uh, conditions like uh, um, renal stones, etc. So it is not recommended to use high doses of vitamin C, but obviously using vitamin C uh, in, in, in a normal uh, amount or normal dose will be helpful. The last agent is one of the oldest agents in use, uh, is colchicine. Colchicine is widely used in, in gout, in the acute phases or uh, stages of of gout. It is used in a rare condition here in Australia, which is the familial Mediterranean fever. And, and its use actually is not clear, but so that uh, it might be an anti-inflammatory effect. Now, more recently, this agent used in this research for an anti-mitotic, for uh, anti-cancer agent uh, through what they describe it as the tubulin inhibition. By, by the inhibiting and disintegrating of this agent, it affects the, the, the cell growth. And currently, there is uh, one study coming from Canada in phase three, using this agent in COVID-19. Thank you.